Thank you, Miss Pat. I'm gonna go turn the organ off. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Take this the right way. That's an old war horse. You remember the illustration of the war horses? They've been used to being in battle and they've been shot at and stabbed and saber slashed and that old general, cavalry general, couldn't stand to see him shot. So he just bought a bunch of them and took them and put them out in the pasture. And when they'd hear the thunderstorm start rolling, they thought it was cannon fire and they would all line up in the pasture on, them own, on their own, make a straight line and stand there, look up at that thunderstorm coming and think they're ready to go to battle. You can maybe learn to play the piano and organ and those kind of things, but that faithfulness, boy, if you could get that. Boy, if you could get that. You wait and see, man. It'll be something. Second Kings chapter number 6. Second Kings chapter number 6. And I know you don't need the explanation, but Brother Waters had to leave you know, he holds a pretty high position where he's at and they're looking for the um, individual that shot the deputy up north of us here and uh, they're trying to find him. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an amazing thing to me. I, I don't say his name intentionally. It's just like that boy that killed my friend over in Tallahassee that was standing in a a crowd and set a house on fire and ambushed him when he showed up on a Saturday. Literally just showed up and shot him right in the face and killed him on the spot. Um, and I intentionally, when I was, had the privilege of doing that funeral with all those deputies and stuff that were there, gathered there in Tallahassee and all the dignitaries and stuff, I intentionally didn't even mention his name. And you say, why? It's just, just being mean. No, it's not. They don't deserve to have their name mentioned. What a, what a discredit to the Marine Corps. One of the greatest branches of the service that there is, and he can't even follow orders because he's got a bad tag on his car. He shoots somebody. What, what a thing, somebody that says they can follow orders and they, and they can't take orders from somebody and kills a man. And You say, who is he? His name is Mr. Pinhead. You can drop the Mr., he doesn't, des- he doesn't deserve the credit. Let me clear that out of my head now. I don't, I don't want to take that out on y'all. You're living in a rotten society, boy. The, the authority has become the, the number one issue now. Nobody's going to tell anybody what to do. I wore out with it. The Bible says in the last days that even the children don't obey their parents. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. First Timothy 3, disobedient to parents. It's so, the Lord puts it in the Bible. Yeah. Ah, goodness, man. All right, you're all familiar with this story. I'm positive you've read it many times over. I'm going to use it as a jumping off place or in make an illustration about it to try to give you some things practically about the, uh, about the Christian life. And some things that you have to consider in these last days. Now, I'll give you, I guess I will say, a a spoiler alert, I think is a new way of saying it. I'll give you a precursor. I'll give you a warning. Uh, There's some things that I'm going to say in the message that are pretty rough. Uh, There are some things that I believe need to be said, but they're not easy things to say. I'm going to do my best to not let my tone override the, the importance of the words themselves. I'd like for you to just pay attention this morning for just a very few minutes. I'll do my best to to get you out of here at a decent time to try to set things up, but to show you the progression of an individual who winds up wanting to serve the Lord and then loses the thing that God gave him. And the end result of that, if you don't get it back, it doesn't get better on its own and it never repairs itself. It's incumbent upon you as a Christian to maintain your relationship with the Lord. 
It is not his responsibility to maintain his relationship with you. 2 Kings chapter number 6, the Bible says this, and I'll let you be seated. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, under Jordan, and take hence of being. Let us make a, a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood, and one was felling a beam. The axe head fell into the water, and he cried. And he said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore he, uh, said he, Take it up unto thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it up. Now, I want to do a couple things different this morning. First of all, I'm going to ask all of you to be seated except Brother Larry. I'm going to have him pray. And gentlemen, I want you to leave the microphones in here in the congregation. I want you to leave them on. I want, uh, I, I want the people that are tuning in because you're living in an unprecedented time. Uh, there's a lot of people that join us all over. I even found out a bunch of people when I finished the meeting up there in Plattsburgh, New York, there is a whole slew of people up there that watch your services every Sunday, religiously. And it's imperative that they hear your singing. It's imperative they hear your testimony. And it is imperative that they hear your prayers. And so I, I want you to leave that on. I don't care if it goes out. I, I'm not going to let the, the broadcast control what we wind up doing. This is for the benefit of individuals that don't have it. You know, well, Brother Larry prays a long time. I... I, 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 know, I know. I'm not trying to put any pressure on him, but when you got a hooked up cow, you know what you do? You stay with a hooked up cow. But, but it's important you understand the loyalty that goes behind that. So I, I want you guys, if you would, please, to, to leave that on. I know a lot of times you turn it off and then you start the service up with me preaching. But uh, I think it's imperative that people see there's a lot of ground softening that goes on with our singing and with our solos and uh, with all the things that go transpire in our services prior to the preacher ever getting uh, in the pulpit. So, Brother Larry, I'm going to ask you if you pray in however long, 10 minutes or 5 minutes or whatever it might be. But... You go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll get into the preaching, please. Well, we're grateful to be here this morning, and we thank you, and don't take it lightly. Thank you for your presence already. Help us to understand this morning, Lord, the hours that we've been here, the seriousness of the tone yes. and the setting yes. in this meeting this morning. Now, we're grateful for that. We're grateful, Lord, for how you deal with us, Lord. Sometimes it's more so in praise. Sometimes it's more solemn, Lord. This morning is serious, Lord. Yes. Though it's not all serious, we're not taking it that way or saying it that way. Every time we are granted the time that we can meet, God has a serious matter in our lives. Help us not to waste time. Now I pray our hearts will be cleansed to the hearing. Our ear gates will be open this morning. And most importantly, we pray for the word as it comes forth. We have to give you praise for the word for yes. all its all it is and all it's done in our lives and actively doing in our lives for the direction it gives us continually. For the fellowship that we know and the fellowship, Lord, that we walk with, the companionship we have with you, we give you praise. That's brought us to this place in this hour. I pray for a soul in here or a soul, Lord, that's under the, the hearing, Lord, that doesn't know you. I pray, God, today will be the day they call upon you yes. Yes. as their personal Savior. I pray for our pastor this morning, our preacher, and I pray, Lord, you'd rest upon him in a mighty way. Pray, God, that he'd be able to speak boldly, and, and we'll try to remember always, Lord, that the, the word would have free course, and, Lord, there'd not be any distractions. If there is, beginning with me or anything else, God, I pray you'd soon remove it. I pray for help this morning. We give you all the glory. We thank you for the good singing, and the talents that have been lended, Lord, to sing and to give you praise. Lord, to help set the course or the tone for the meeting. To clear the soul, to open the soul. God, that we might hear. I, I ask you for help for all of us this morning. And we give you all the glory for what's going to be said and done. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. 
bowing our head and having such a place to worship you and lift you up. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask all these things. Amen. 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 Thank you. We have a bad situation that has occurred here. In the passage, what you see before you is, is a man who starts out and desiring to do something it was a good thing. He recognized that there was a need for some room, need for some space. He saw that need, and I'll say this, he was willing to put in the work. He said, hey, can we go cut some wood down? And can we build a bigger space because the place we're in, it's too straight, it's too, it's too small. We need to expand some things. So you can't say that there's anything wrong. There's no frustrated ambition that's going on here with what he desires. He really, he's, he wants to do something and he wants to do things the right way. It doesn't take long before he's out there working and because he doesn't check some things along the way, he finds out the thing that he borrowed, the most important piece of equipment that was borrowed, the piece of equipment that enabled him to be a help to building the building came apart. It, it wasn't his own talent. It wasn't his own prosperity. It wasn't his politics. It wasn't even his ability. All it was was, is, can we go cut some wood down? You got an axe? No. Well, then you cut some wood down, but unless you got a pack of beavers, not much you're going to be able to do. Well, what if I get an axe? I, I can borrow an axe. Okay, you got a borrowed axe. Man, he immediately starts cutting wood. How many of us have started in that situation, but instead of taking the time to every now and then stop to not just sharpen the axe, but stop to check and make sure that there's a wedge holding that axe firm. And with every blow of that axe on the tree, while it may chip out a piece of the tree, it also, as it's pulled loose from that bark, it begins to move on that handle and it begins to create space when otherwise it was tight and the head becomes loose. And, and if you've swung an axe very much at all, especially into a hardwood, not to pine, but into a hardwood, when that head gets loose, it vibrates, it resonates back up into your hand. You can feel it in the handle. Something's loose. I don't believe that this man worked so feverishly that he didn't recognize that the axe head was loose and that he should stop long enough to tighten it up. I don't think it was an accident or happenstance that it just flew off. I think there was a progression of time that he just ignored the inevitable if he didn't stop. One of the most difficult things to recognize in the Christian life, and unfortunately, not everybody is going to make it across the finish line the same way. Yes, we we'll all are saved and we're all going to go to heaven and thank the Lord for that. We can't lose our salvation, but... We're not talking about salvation this morning. We're talking about service. We're talking about having a desire to do something. And God gives you a talent. He gives you an ability. To, to, he loans you something. And He says, listen, I'm going to give you an ability to teach or to preach or to sing or to help or to do. And, and that there's only one problem you need to remember where that came from. Amen. And you need to remember who owns that. Yes. And, and if you're not careful to maintain the relationship with the owner, before long you're swinging the handle and you're doing a lot of things, but you're hurting a lot of people. Amen. Because it's going to be my way or the highway. 
the winds of change have blown upon us. And I remember hearing a story years ago, though it is a, an older story. Some of you younger ones have not ever heard the story of a big church in North Carolina. Matter of fact, it was in Hendersonville, North Carolina, just a stone's throw away from Asheville, not far from where Brother Jim was up there in Valdez. And there was a good church there, and there was an old deacon that was in that church and the new pastor had come in and, and taken over and the church seemed to be moving along pretty good and something happened in that church that had not happened since the days of old. People actually started getting saved and people started coming to the church. New people, brand new believers, people that had not ever been there before and, and they were babes in Christ and they were coming in and, and he would preach and the people would get in encouraged and, and they would start coming to the altar and then they wanted to get involved in service and then what really happened that really kind of turned things the wrong way was all of a sudden people actually would say amen. Praise the Lord. The women would take out their little hankies back in those days and they would say preacher that's good. And that deacon was no longer the preeminent figure in that church. He had been the one that they had turned to when it came to the pulpit committee and, and when it came to running things. And you might even say that he thought in his mind he was the surrogate pastor. The church had come away from its Southern Baptist roots, but they had retained that one long root that was in there with the deacons controlling things that went on in the church. And he began to lose his grip of how he wanted things done. And that man went down to the courthouse and filed a lawsuit to prevent the people from shouting in church. It's a true story. And the church was aghast because the entire membership, because they were on a roll, was actually being brought into that lawsuit and had to appear in court with a spokesman. And they went down to that courthouse and here's the deacon at the table for the plaintiff and here are all of these individuals and they're calling them in and one by one, he is, the attorney got up there and called the people in. And do you shout in church? Well, yes. <laughs> what do you shout? Well, I'll shout amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah. And up in Carolina, it's hallelujah. <laughs> and one at a time, individuals had a, a great opportunity to come. It wasn't before a jury. It was in front of a judge. And one at a time, people came in and said, yes, sir, we, we do. We shout. And and, you know, we shout those things. And yes, we do get excited. And in those days, in church services, sometimes people would actually run the aisles. And I, and I don't mean like, like a race or anything like that. Running the aisles is just, I'm full up. And so they'd walk down the aisles and all that, you know, and, and that kind of a thing. And people would get excited. And do you go to the altar? Yes. Do you cry in church? Yes. And, and the suit was something about it being far too emotional. It wasn't a, a sports thing or whatever. And after they rested their case, the spokesman for the other, for the congregation, the pastor stood up and said, yes, sir, I guess you could say that we are guilty of all of those things, but our constitution and bylaws has nothing forbidding that. We do things decently and in order, and he made the thing. And the judge sat back, the story is told. And he looked at the whole situation in disgust and he took his gavel and intentionally pointed it at the plaintiff's table. And he said, sir, if you think I am fool enough to rule on a case that has no business in a courthouse anyway, Amen. to tell God's people that they can't praise God, you're a fool yourself. And with that, he slammed the gavel down and said, case dismissed. That deacon stood up at that table and put those brawny fists on that table. And he said, over my dead body. And he left the courtroom. He went down to the church there in Hendersonville, North Carolina. 
And with an old brace and bit, he bored two holes through the main two front doors of that little wooden church. And he ran a logging chain through it. And he put a lock on it. That was on Friday afternoon after court. Saturday morning, they went to that deacon's house and he was dead. And they had a funeral service for that deacon. And they had a church service on Sunday. You say, why? The winds of change. I'm going to do it my way or y'all are going to take the highway. That's the way it used to be in the South. In the South it used to be, we don't care what God says. Would you agree with me when I say to you, that deacon had long since lost his axe head, long since remembered why he was ever given the privilege to serve, makes me pause to think to the three deacons we have here, we don't have those kind of deacons, but makes me reminded to say also, that deacon a long since lost his axe head and all he did was swing the handle and was just hurting himself and other people along the way. Is that a fair statement to say? You say, preacher, never happened. Well, no, I, I know that none of you people are abominable. But the Lord that says, he who sows discord among the brethren is one of the seven abominations. Six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And one of those things is to sow discord among the brethren. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, I wouldn't let her sing. Well, I wouldn't let him preach. Well, if I, if I, if I, if I, deacon with a logging chain. Absalom at the gate. One of the things that I fear is as I go through this thing and, and try my best to stay in fellowship with the Lord is a scare, one of the scariest stories, horrifying stories in the Bible to me is the story of one great judge in the book of Judges. His name was Samson. He was given supernatural strength, a gift, an axe head. That he was given by God. He did not have it. He didn't go to the gym. I, if I painted, would not paint Samson as Arnold Schwarzenegger or whoever is the big burly guys nowadays. I would paint him as a natural, common, ordinary man. I wouldn't even paint him in the body of an athlete. I mean, I wouldn't paint him with a, you know, gigantic roof over his shoes, but I, I would... Just paint him as a common man. Because the Bible said his strength was a demonstration of the gift God had given him and the way that people knew God was on him was the supernatural strength. They could not attribute anything to him. They would have to say, man, how's that little pipsqueak have that much power? God axe head. And man, when he was in hooked up with God and that handle was firmly affixed to that thing, he could take the gates off of a city. He could kill a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. He could do unspeakable, take a lion and tear him like a paper bag. He could break the cords and slay the Philistines. But the Bible says that one day when he laid in the bosom of iniquity, and he fell asleep and got comfortable after he had been warned repeatedly. Your axe head's loose, Samson. Hey, Samson, Samson, wake up! Your axe head's loose. You need to make a sacrifice. You touch the dead body. You got to shave the consecration of your head. You got to shave your hair off. You got to make the sacrifice. A lamb, a ram, and a he go. Samson, your axe head's loose. And he just ignored it. And one in time and another time and another time and the Lord still used him in spite of the loose axe head and the trees fell. And he said, yeah, it's, it's, it must be okay. I still got the power. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. That's okay, baby, I got it. Wakes up and stretches, pops those cords. 
goes out and wears them out like last year's blue jeans. And the Bible says he one day woke up and wist not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. But you know what he thought? I still got my accent. No, that was borrowed. Well, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They may be without repentance, but you won't have the power on that accent if it's in the bottom of the Jordan River. He may not take it away from you, but if you don't remember where it came from and you don't work at maintaining that thing that he gave you, he will let that thing come off and let it go to the bottom of the river. And he gets up, well, you know, the horrible story. Can I say this to you? Be careful about jumping to the end of the story and saying, yeah, but he killed more in his death than he did in his life. No, 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 you're justifying a loose axe head. You're justifying a lost axe head. That was done to bring glory to God, not to Samson. I start looking at that and I think to myself, man, what in the world could happen? You know, sometimes you can get so busy, you're not even aware that things are starting to get... Can I use the today's terminology... Loose. We used to have a saying, I think you had it in the military also, but we used to have a saying. When you're doing special operations and you're doing covert operations, loose lips sink ships. Loose language begins to, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth Speaks. Not really talking much about Jesus anymore. Start off talking about work and sports and start off talking about uh, plans and ideas and things and self-justification and then an occasional D jumps out and an occasional F jumps out and an occasional S jumps out and an occasional GD jumps out and, a, and an occasional instead of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, it's used now because, you know, I mean, they, it, it, it's just, it just a little loose. A little loose in your tire, a little loose in your... Typical, your, your, your habits. A little loose in your company. Amen. Give you something to think about just for while we're going through this. And it'll just take me a few minutes. I, I hope it'll help you. But did you ever think about this? Amnon had a good daddy. I know David made some mistakes. But Amnon had a godly daddy. But he had a rotten friend. We're talking about loose associates. Amnon had a friend. His name was Jonadab. And he was a very subtle man. You know what that subtle man led him to do? Rape his sister. Godly daddy. Rotten friend. Jonathan had a rotten daddy but a godly friend. Yes. Yes. Amen. You know what that tells me? Friends often have more influence than parents. Amen. And the next thing you know, and the head is off, you're hanging out with friends and your looseness begins to show up and, and all of a sudden the law of gravity begins to take place and, and the Lord's saying, hey, 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 your axe head's off. But you're still beating the trees. Sometimes that bitterness for not being able to do it how you want to do it is all it takes for your axe head to go swimming. 
into the Jordan River it goes and now that axe head is affected by all of the currents that are in that area. The currents of ambition, the currents of speed, time, bitterness, selfishness, envy, pride, expectations, routine duty, social media, popular opinion, what the people say, in touch with the people, a man of the people, a woman of the people, the people, the people, the people, oh the people love me, the people loved Absalom. One of the 18 types of the Antichrist, Absalom, just because your friends love you and like you and work well with you doesn't mean you're not the Antichrist. The Antichrist, when he comes to power, says that the whole world wanders after him. The world is in love with him. But when your axe head is in the Jordan River, you begin to survey the territory and say, well, I must be all that in a bag of chips. Everybody likes me. Who are you polling? Yeah. Amen, amen. You can make a poll say whatever you want. That's right, right. Yep. Amen. Yes. Are you hearing me, boys? Right. That's right. Amen. This, for me is one of the most serious messages I've ever tried to preach. One of the things that must be understood is that just because I can go to people that like me, no, they don't know what others know. They didn't know that Absalom was out of fellowship with David. They did not know that he had done some things. He was a murderer. They did not know that he had the ambition to be the king and he intended to by force take the kingdom. But he had friends, including David's chief advisor. And honestly, Absalom thought... In his mind, I should be there because, you know, after all, I am all that in a bag of chips. Look at all the people who like me. They don't have a problem with me. No, here's what you know about the people that were following Absalom who was swinging the handle. They had a problem with the king. They weren't following Absalom. They were going against the king. Their axe heads were swimming as much as Absalom's was. Affected by the current. Yeah, Absalom said, I, I know he didn't give you what you wanted, and the chance you wanted, and the opportunity that you wanted. And, but but I, if, if I was there, I'd give you that. Sounds like a political race, doesn't it? I know the former guy didn't give you your stuff, but boy, put me in there, I'll give you everything you want. They're not voting for this guy because they like him. They're voting for this guy because they don't like him. Listen carefully. I wrote it so I would not misquote it. Tragically, and far over, the axe head is often replaced with a self-made axe head made out of frustration, ambition, and cheap imitations of what originally the axe head was intended for. And the further down the river there goes, the real thing is replaced with self-delusion and forges an axe head that is formed by a sick mind. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't mess up. The guy that I borrowed the axe from he should have told me. He should have given me some instruction. You know, it was a bad axe to begin with. You see, preacher, people ain't, people ain't going to put up with this kind of stuff. I know. It's not easy to say, but it is so true. You say, why? I've been doing this for a long time. 
And I got very, very clear understanding of how people can become so twisted and how even a counterfeit axe can chop some trees down. But that axe has now been shaped and formulated on the grindstone of a deluded mind. You have Bible for that? No, it's just how I feel. Are your feelings in line with the Bible? No. I don't care. I want it my way. I'm justified. It makes sense to me. But what does the Bible say? I don't care. And all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, your relationship with the one who loaned you that act is actually in question because it is no longer I've been given a great gift and I've been given the responsibility, the privilege of serving with that gift. Now all of a sudden, well, that gift was given for me. That position was given for me. And that position was for my spotlight on me. And then before long, you didn't get the chance to sing. God forbid the preacher decided to preach before the second song and now you're, I'm, I'm leaving the church. I've been practicing all week. And he called somebody from the floor. It wasn't even practice to get up there and sing. He had somebody come up behind me after I done brought down the Shekinah glory. I don't know why them old hussies up there in the kitchen put her tater salad in front of my tater salad. Lost your axe head. But because you will refuse to admit that you lost his borrowed axe head, you will forge your own axe head, but that axe head will be shaped by a deluded mind. Liberalism will step in. And before long, you'll be thinking and doing things that you would never even think and do. You said, never happened to me. I hope not, but remember Samson wist not. Trying to hurry, axe heads borrowed. If you have no money, you have to pay for it with slavery. When you lose his axe head, you're going to do things in your own strength. And you're going to be a slave to yourself or someone else. You're going to serve somebody. This is where the justification process comes in. This is where the, well, I, I tried, but, you know, they just didn't let me. Well, I, I tried. Well, wait, wait, whoa, wait, hold on. Weren't you coming there for the book? Weren't you coming there for the fellowship? Or is the truth you were coming there the whole time for the spotlight? And you forgot where the gift came from. Amen. And you know what I know about him? He has a right anytime he wants to say, hey, can I have my axe back? Come, if you will, with me to Titus chapter 2. Let me cut a little bit out of the middle of this to try to get you to the end. Preacher, this is pretty hard. No, no, it's not really. It's, it's, it's introspective. It's about human nature. It's about recognizing that anybody that's doing anything has been given the gift. It's borrowed. God gave it to you. There's not a Sunday school teacher in here that's doing it just because they're a gifted to teach. Wait, who gave them the gift to teach in the first place? Amen. But a Sunday school teacher even is not allowed. I don't care if it's Brother Sam, Brother Woodard, or whatever. They have to turn in teaching syllabus. They have to have a curriculum. I don't care if it's all of our ladies that work in there. Well, you wouldn't tell me what to do. That's why you're not doing it. Amen. Would you want someone to walk into your family and... Hey, Brother Brian, I'm going to take your kids and I'm going to tell them what to do. Now, we've been friends a long time. 
Right? You and Miss Jennifer, we've been friends, and you like me a little bit. Even though I do come to steak dinner with a suit on. <clears throat> right? But if I come over there and I say, I'm going to take this portion, I'm going to take the Peyton portion of your family. Now you go ahead and deal with them other two, but I'm going to take the Peyton portion and I'm going to make Peyton my ministry. Would that be the proper use of my axe head? Would you want that done in your family? Let me see if I can transfer that. Why then when you come to your boss and he says to you, this is what I want you to do. Oh no, I don't do that. And he said, then we don't want you. So you do it. No, I'm, I'm more highly qualified than that. This is the position we have. If you want a job, this is what you will do. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've done it. I don't care about your credentials. I have this job for this amount of money that needs to be done. You want the job or not? Well, now, the way I see it is all that, get out. Third, come to church. Gehazi had this attitude that Elijah's ministry existed for him to have a ministry. Uh, Gehazi never saw himself as a servant. He saw himself as an equal to Elisha. I'm the same. One of the things that people miss in 2 Kings chapter number 4 is Gehazi is given the opportunity if he would do the things the way that the old prophet told him to do it, he would have the power to do it. But when he decided to divorce himself from that and do it his own way, God made a fool of him and revealed you ain't got no power because you're out of the line of authority. And lets him be made a fool. And eventually he winds up shucking and jiving and making a deal with Naaman because he had it. It's revealed in the passage, oh, I, I, I'm the same as him. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a servant. The gift that was given to Gehazi was the same thing that had been given to Elisha. Elisha accepted the fact that he was nothing more than a servant pouring on the hands of the preacher, the water. That's all he was for 10 years. I don't have that problem here. I'm making a broad application. This isn't about me. This is about when the Lord says to you, I want you to be a servant. Now, I'm not, I, I, mm -mm. <laughs> I'm not going to be a take orders from other people. You know who I am? You know where I've been? You remember the lady? You don't remember the lady. But I just real quickly remind you that came to me and told me that I just had to have her sing and how great she was and wonderful she was. And then she takes out that little book of CDs and I said, man, we don't do that here. Oh, man. I thought I had shoveled peanut butter up a wildcat tied in with a pitchfork. <laughs> I mean, boy. That's probably too visual. <laughs> Man, she turned on me and about clawed me to death. Well, at such and such a church, and 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 I just simply said, then why aren't you still at that church? And she stormed out. Same thing happened. It's not just a woman thing with the guy with the buses. And all of a sudden, God sent him literally from California over here for the purpose of starting a ministry. When I said, you fill up your car, we'll talk about a van. And he found himself across the river. Because he's like, well, I, I think I misunderstood. My GPS was wrong. I don't think they really wanted me to come here. They wanted me to go there because I'm not here to just fill up my car. I'm here for you to give me the keys to the bus. I'm a, I'm a bus captain. We don't, we don't have that position here. I'm a pastor. Uh, that one's filled. Well, you need to move over and let me... Uh, sorry, skewma. Uh-uh, ain't happening. 
Well, where I used to be, then go back. Start your own. Are you beginning to see the picture? Because the gift you've been given, sometimes it doesn't come to fruition. It starts off with, can I trust you to be a servant? Can you take orders? And then after Elijah's dead, the mantle falls. He don't immediately think, yeah, I finally got it. He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because I can't do it if I don't stay in subjection to what God says. Am I making sense to you? Down the river, that current takes that axe head. I'll give you a couple of things here. It must have been a very tragic deal. Look in Titus chapter number 2. Pick it up in verse number 6. Young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, whether you like it, people are watching. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say anything to you. Can I say this? When your speech is sound, your attitude is right, and the pattern you set is correct. Somebody will say a cuss word and they'll say, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. When people can comfortably cuss around you that know you, that's very telling about how they know you. You shouldn't be embarrassed. Excuse me, preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, you know how that flesh is? Well, I mean, you, hey, bro, it's between you and the Lord. I mean, you don't have to embarrass them, but it's like, Okay, well, at least they have enough respect for the office. Excuse me, preacher. Slipped up there, sorry. But you know what he said? There's a man's responsibility found in the passage. I'm coming back to the axe head in just a second. The first thing, if you want to know what a real man is in the Bible, he has a responsibility to protect the family that God gave him. And if he's a pastor, he has a responsibility to protect the sheep God gave him. The second responsibility for a man in the Bible is to not just protect but provide. And the third responsibility, gentlemen, is for that man to be a pattern to all them that are following after him. You say, ah, what's the big deal? Well, David and Solomon are talking one day. David's coming to the end of his life giving out final instructions. David says to Solomon, these are the things you need to do and this is what it's like to be a king and God's chosen you to do this and that and the other. And Solomon, he said, can I ask you a question, Daddy? He said, sure. He said, uh, you meet Mama at church? I mean, you know, we go to church all the time. I figure you must have met Mama in church. David tells the outer guard, could uh, you guys uh, close the door there where well, that chicken has come home to roost and sitting right on the pinnacle of the top of that roof, man. He said, Solomon, uh, that's sort of a rough question, son. Well, I mean, after all, Dad, you're wanting me to pattern my life after yours, Right? Keep in the back of your mind a great way to create a pervert. Did Solomon have a thousand wives and concubines? Wonder how he got that twisted. You don't think it's because of a daddy who did something, tried to cover it, and then had to live with it. Solomon is the son of Bathsheba. You know, when David didn't keep his appointments, when the men go out to war, when David stayed at the house, maybe it went like this. Daddy, you meet Mama at church? Uh, 
No. Well, tell me how that romance blossomed. How'd that go? What, what was that like? Uh, I saw your mama up on a roof naked one day and, ooh, daddy. Yeah, I took her. Well, I bet her daddy was mad. Uh, no. No. He wouldn't care that you did that to his daughter. No, her granddaddy was upset, but she had a husband. Man, Solomon's asking some tough questions and David's heart is now telling him the truth and Solomon's heart, wise or not, is just broke like an egg under a giant's heel. What, Daddy? She had a husband. I bet he was mad. How is it you're alive, Daddy? I mean... Murder and adultery. If he didn't kill you, the people would have killed you. Well, I'm a king, you know. Yeah, but daddy, how did that husband not? <coughs> I had him killed, son. Sir? I murdered him. I wrote a letter, sent it by his own hand and had him get too close to the wall and they smushed his head and broke his brains out all over the rocks. Her husband was named Uriah the Hittite. Great pattern, Daddy. I got the pattern for the temple. I got the pattern for how to be a king. I wonder, Daddy, uh, how could that happen to somebody like you? David said, well, routine duty, I had fought and won a lot of battles. It seems like every time I went out to battle, I won. <laughs> Started with a bear and a lion. You've heard the stories. And then Goliath. 200 Philistines. Multitude of battles. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty amazing. You know, son, I got to thinking that it was me winning those battles. My axe head started coming loose. And it fell off. Kaploosh out there in the Jordan. And the current began to take it away. And everything I had been taught, and everything I had taught, and everything that I had done, all of that began to shift and change. And it was almost like listening to a psychiatrist making sense of all the way that I felt because it's like who I really was and why didn't I get what I really wanted to get. And all, I mean, I just kind of felt like this, you know, life is after all I've given enough. I should take a little bit. And, and the next thing I know, he said, I, I, I really didn't realize. He said, but I have to tell you this. Long before I messed up in 2 Samuel 11, I had long before that lost my axe head. And it led to, led to some bad decisions. I might even say I was like one of my nemesis named Nabal. When I had a chance to repent, I didn't. I was stubborn like Nabal. And my heart was hard like Nabal. Daddy, who's Nabal? <sighs> At least I waited for him to die. But I was going to kill him and take his wife too. So 
Son, when I first came back to Ziklag and the whole place was burned, I had been out of fellowship with God. I'd been doing things on my own. And God let my wives and the kids be taken away and all the stuff and they spake a stone in me and I deserved it. And the Lord tried to help me and I got right and I recovered all, but I didn't recover my fellowship. I didn't get my axe head back. And I kept making decisions with the wrong axe head. And there were some trees that fell along the way, just enough to make me think everything's all right. God's still blessing me. Bless the prodigal too out in the far country for a while. The sun I got dry, I got dehydrated. Before long, instead of absorbing water, I repelled it. I got angry. Sunburned, irritated. Before long, I was dead as last year's corn shucks. And God tried to tell me. And God tried to tell me. And I got where I couldn't hear God anymore. Quickly turn to Psalms 119. And I'm going to close. He said some things got in the way, son. He said, I've had to pay four sheep for a sheep, but it didn't hurt me as much as it is to have to tell my own son that uh, he was conceived by a, a man who was an adulterer and a murderer. Would you allow me the time to give you a positive prescription on how to fix it? but only if you want to. Amen. Amen. Anger, wrath, strife, bitterness, emulations can be placed onto an anvil, taken out of a vehement fire and hammered into a counterfeit axe head, taken to the grinder and sharpened and on face value, they look the same. But it's a counterfeit axe hit. And what it's cutting is not what God wants cut. And the one holding it is wielding it with the wrong set of gifts. What we often do is take what God's given us by His grace and we replace it with a counterfeit and we think, that's okay. We turn our nose up at that because we won't do what I'm going to show you here. This comes down to that serious part. been a while since I've been so heavily burdened for people that are allowing things to get between them and what God originally had them doing personal thoughts and ideas and prejudices and politics and all kind of things are all of a sudden sweeping in and people are forging their axe heads and we become more and more like the church who's got a lot going on and we forgot we left our first loved. He's out in the Jordan, the place of death. David writing in Psalms 119 verse 45, I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, I have pinned, please, O oh Lord. I, I, I messed up. This time I'll keep thy statutes. 146, I cried, save me, and I'll keep thy testimonies. I'm in Psalm 119. <clears throat> 147, I prevented the dawning of the morning. And I cried, I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. 
Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgment. Thy, or they draw nigh that follow after mischief. They're far from the law. I'm with the wrong crowd. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known thee of the old that thou hast founded forever. David says, I, I've messed up. The product of the mess up is the adultery, the murder, the numbering of Israel, the ill-gotten decisions, the wrong thing. Why? Because I forgot who it was that gave me what he gave me. Well, quickly, if you want to turn, I'll just tell you the story. That prophet in training is what I call him. Realized that that axe head had been loaned to him in good conscience. Feeling like that when he was done with it, that the owner of that would get his axe head back and to some degree be able to take credit for the work that had been done with his axe head. He couldn't go swing the axe head. Maybe he was a cripple. Maybe he was old. But he said, hey, listen, I can contribute this to you. I, I, I can pray for you. I can help you. I can financially support you. I can give you opportunities. I can give you chances. I, I, I can't do it, but I can, I, can, I can give you something. And the Bible said he cried. And he went to the preacher. And the preacher said, why are you crying? And he's a southern boy. He said, preacher, I done messed up. He said, what'd you do? You cut yourself out there working. I've been watching you work. No, sir. Worse than that. Okay, well, what is it? Remember that axe I borrowed? Sure I do. John Henry gave you that thing from down there, so-and-so. Where's it at? The head come off the handle. The business end. I got careless. It's in the bottom of the Jordan River. Preacher says, why don't we go back? Samson? Long for Delilah. Why don't we go back, Samson, find out where you lost that, that axe head? Long before you went over there and married another outlandish woman and ultimately have her and her father and your father-in-law killed and burned after you burned the foxtails. Hey, Samson, where did you... Where'd you lose that thing? David, where'd that, where'd that thing come off? He said, come here, preacher, I can show you. In that guy's mind, you know what he's thinking to himself? <laughs> what good is that going to do? Going back to where I lost it? What good's that going to do? You know what people think? What good's that going to do? Where did you get bitter? Where did you get angry? Where did you ah, Where did you get where? What good's that going to do? What's done is done. Is what it is. No, it's a reminder I made a decision at this crossroad right here. I decided right there, I'm going to do what I want to do. He said, right here, preacher. He said, you know, I noticed something here, young man. And he said, yes, sir, preacher, what's that? And he said, I can't quite see the river there. There's something between us and it. He said, yes, sir, that, that stick's there. He goes, I didn't even see that stick. 
I didn't even know that stick was there. I, I don't even know how. I know that after the axe had come off and I heard the noise of the splash and, and that kind of thing and I felt my stomach sink and I realized, man! And then I recognized, man, where did that stick come from? And he said, it's almost like that thing just grew up overnight. And he said, well, before we can get there, we're going to have to take down that thing that stands between you and getting it back. And the preacher says, this might have been a good thing for you to do before you lost that axe head, son. You might get out on your knees and bow your head and take that knife and work it around this stick to get it out of the way because you lost your axe head because there was always something between you and it. It's just representative of why you're where you are. And a little sapling falls because it only takes a little thing to interrupt God's work. Just a little wobble in the cart. And Elijah says, I think, interpreting the tears of a broken-hearted young preacher, he sees the sincerity of the repentance and the desperation of the situation. And he prays and he says, Lord, could you give it back to him? Don't let this be the epitaph on his life. Let him have his axe head back so he can finish the course and keep the faith and be done. And the Bible says the iron did swim. I don't believe God would have allowed the iron to swim if he had not noted the sincerity of the repentance of that young preacher and the desperation in which he cried. It swam over to the edge of the Jordan River. That boy's thinking, man, you've got to be kidding. I get another opportunity. Man, you've got to be kidding. What if it sinks before I get it? I, what if I get it? And it waits till it gets just close enough, and then Elijah doesn't reach down there and hand it to him. Because you can't swing somebody else's axe. That axe head was given to that boy. And he said, take it up. This and I'm done. I think he got down there on all fours. I think he laid down there, man. He grabbed that axe head and pulled it up. And I think for I don't know how long, he just held it right here and rocked like a woman rocking a baby. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the old preacher just taps him on the back. He don't have to give him any more instruction. And after a while, that boy goes over and he gets that old axe handle, probably hickory handle. He sets that handle there and Puts that axe head on it. Gets him a couple wedges and drives them down in there. Gets him a little Gorilla Glue and puts it on there. Gets him some duct tape and makes him some X bands around it. Ties some rope around the thing. Now the axe head's so heavy he can hardly swing it. 
makes a couple of licks on a tree and then, okay, just check it. I bet two things. I bet number one, he checked that ax head on a regular basis from that point forward. I bet number two, he didn't chop wood that close to the river anymore. That young prophet did not know how close he was to the river of death until that axe head came off. How about you? Where'd you lose it? Are you continuing to swing the handle or maybe you've replaced it with a counterfeit? Maybe economics has replaced it. Job, promotion, recognition, popularity. Maybe that old axe head of doctrine is not that important anymore. Maybe it's just all about, hey, you know what? They just need to know how many trees I chopped down. And the simplicity of I got an axe and I get to cut a tree is no longer enough. You trade in the axe. It takes a while to get it done. You get a chainsaw and you speed becomes the new replacement. Preacher, we got a new way. We got a faster way. We can get the contemporary music and we can get the people in here. Preacher, if we could just change the book and not mention so much about King James and don't ever mention Dr. Ruckman and Preacher, if you could just, I mean, man, we could really speed up the process. We could really get things going and you say, Preacher, what are you doing? I'm just checking my axe head. Preacher, you know, if you was home more often and just doing all this traveling, not going all these places and doing stuff, I mean, Preacher, if you were here and you're knocking on doors and you're visiting people and you're doing this and that and the other, and Preacher, we could do this and that and the other and all that kind of stuff. Preacher, what are you doing over there? Just checking my axe head. Just making sure it's still attached. You see, because what you're talking about is not the gift that he gave me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I don't own this axe. But it's my job to maintain this axe. How about you? I don't see many, with the exception of a couple, I would put my dad in that mix. He went out the right way. The old preacher, 94, out the right way. Brother Donovan, some of those faithful old soldiers. Brother Larry, Brother Brad, Brother Roger, Brother Richard. Some of you ladies been around here 25, 30 years. You say, what is that? Listen to me, every one of you. This is not David talking. This is not your friend. This is your pastor telling you, you better check your wax head. The longer you swing it, the looser it can become. And the duller it can get, you better check it. How you know it's coming loose? It starts to resonate and people start to bother you. You start looking at what everybody else is doing. Why aren't they doing? You forgot what a blessing it is. I got an ax, I get to swing it. Where's so-and-so? Why aren't they here? What are they doing? What about? It's like, better check your axe head. You better check your axe head. I'm going to close with this. I was very fortunate, not embarrassingly so, to have a great daddy. My daddy was a man of unusual principles. in gigantic character. He knew how to do what he didn't like to do. Or he'd have never been able to pastor the places he was and do the things that he did. The double-bladed axe that we had, I had hit a hickory tree with it and I had splintered the handle 
where it ties into the Acts. And my dad, he, he, he tried to, to fix it best he could, but he said, boy, I don't want you swinging that ax. If that head comes off, it could hit you or hit somebody else, it could kill them. And he said, I borrowed an ax from Mr. Patterson. You've got to finish your work. In those days, we weren't allowed to play with chainsaws. We'd have killed somebody. He believed in blisters and calluses. And have people haul off trash like they do today. You threw it in the back of a truck and took it somewhere or you had a burn pile. So I'm chopping the limbs. My dad comes out, I'll never forget it. He said, when's the last time you checked your axe, boy? I said, sir, that's a clue. That means never. He said, have you checked your axe lately? I said, no, sir. He said, come here. Let me see it. He put that big old hand of his on the top part of that axe, hammer on the back side, the little red end over here, the where the business end is, it had all been kind of worn back, the paint had, and this end is a little bit red there. Been around a while, and he took it and he could move that axe head. He said, boy, even though the handle's good, this axe right now is just as dangerous as the one you splintered. He said, come here, I'll show you something. He took me over there on a piece of concrete right there under the carport, and up there in Rossville, up in the mountains there. He hit that, hand, that axe handle on the bottom of the floor like that. He didn't turn it over this way. He hit it on the bottom. When he got it in there, it had tightened it up. I said, okay, it's good to go. He said, just hold on a minute now. He went and got a little tiny wedge. Little, I mean, a little, little tiny thing. He had to look through the little toolbox to find it. I mean, it wasn't... It probably wasn't that wide, about that long. He said, bring me a hammer. Put it up there, and he said, now drive that down in there. He said, okay, it's ready. Step number one is, is you drive the handle as deep into the ax head as you possibly can. And once it's there, you put something in it that makes you glued to its side because you realize without it, it can be very dangerous. And then he handed it back and said, now go finish what I told you to do. I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 years old. Why do I remember that today? Because some of you need to hit the floor and drive the handle back up in the head because it's gotten loose, hasn't it? And some of you, after you hit it in the floor, you know what you need to do? You need to put the book in there so it winds up tightening that handle down and gets that head back on there. And You need to do that before you go back to work. And if you'll do that, you have the potential to finish the job that God's given you to do. And if you don't, you'll still go to heaven. And when you sit the judgment seat of Christ and he says to you, when I ask you a question, yes, sir, ask away. Where's that ax head I loaned you? What's going to be your answer? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Some have already responded. I'm not going to play an invitation hymn. I know I've been long. But if God spoke to you, maybe even rather than coming to the altar, if you don't feel you can make your way down, maybe right there where you are, maybe you might kneel by your bench 
folks are coming. Preacher, my axe head's loose. Good, it's great you recognized it. Stop working. Stop working. Preacher, I've lost my axe head. There ain't no way it's coming back. You'd be surprised what God would do for the repentant man. David committed adultery and murder and there was no more sacrifice for what he did and yet God forgave him and surpassed the sacrifice for him because of his attitude of repentance. And Paul, or Saul, when he was confronted with it, he blamed the people. I don't know which one you are. But I know this. There's Bible believers in the Laodicean church age. As time begins to tick down, instead of blaming politics and panic and prejudice and media and all the other things in a pandemic, maybe it's time that we make an evaluation of ourselves and say, Lord, truth is I lost my axe head. If you're watching online, can I ask you this question right now? Before you turn it off, I know you're fixing to, I know you've had enough. If you're watching online, can I ask you this question? Why wouldn't you ask him for it back? Why doesn't it bother you that you lost it? You didn't lose your salvation. You're saved. You still got the handle. <laughs> it ain't going nowhere. You know that special gift He gave you? He gave that to you. It wasn't your talent. It wasn't your ability. He gave that to you. You know what He's going to do at the judgment seat one day? He's going to call you into account. What would you do with the gift I gave you? Lord, I buried it in the earth. If I knew Thou were an austere man and reaped where You did not sow. Thou wicked and slothful servant. Heavenly Father, with your help, I have tried to do what you've asked me to do. It may not have been as eloquent as you would have liked to have seen it. I pray, Lord, you might take it with the soberness and the somberness it was intended to be. And for the few that took it that way, that it would mean something to them to help them to contemplate those things. And for the others that could care less, I pray, Lord, that we'll not be distracted by that. But Lord, help us to get our handles firmly attached back to the axe head and get busy about what you've called us to do in these last days. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.